Dr. Lauren Lownian, and I'm going to be talking about genome editing. I'm going to tell you the definition of genome editing. I'm going to give you three reasons for doing genome editing. I'm going to tell you about four technologies or the names of four technologies important in genome editing. And I'm going to talk about the two shared properties that all of those technologies have. So one definition, three reasons why, four methods, and two shared properties. Genome editing means to change the genome, and you could change the genome by deletions, insertions, modifications, or replacement of genetic information. And you're changing the genome within an organism, a living organism's entire genome. So this is something that we do to um, cells, for example, stem cells, or um, in some cases, and this is highly controversial, this could be something that we would do in germline cells, and therefore those changes would be inherited and transmitted into all the offspring in future. So there are other names for genome editing. For example, it's sometimes called genome engineering or gene editing. Um, those are all names for the process that I'm addressing here. This topic falls within the realms of biotechnology or bioengineering and also synthetic biology depending on who's doing the engineering and what the purpose of it is. It is a highly controversial topic, particularly as we are considering, as I said, the possibility of changing human biology in this manner. There are a lot of ethical issues associated with it, and I'm not going to talk about those despite their importance here. So why would we want to edit the genome? I said that I would give you three reasons or three example reasons why. So for one reason, we might, through genome engineering, be able to treat or cure diseases like sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is a genetic condition that affects millions of people in the world. Millions. It's caused by a mutant allele for the beta subunit of the hemoglobin protein, the protein that's responsible for carrying oxygen in our blood. When a person has two copies of the mutant allele, they have copies that contain a point mutation such that they have one particular codon altered from being a wild type GAG sequence into a mutant GTG codon. It's a single adenine to thymine switch, just one tiny nucleotide switch. This tiny change, however, means that instead of having a glutamic acid as the amino acid in position six of um, the amino acid sequence in the beta subunit protein, instead they have a valine. And this small change fundamentally affects the hemoglobin protein itself in such a way that it causes the hemoglobin protein to enforce a sickling shape on the red blood cells that contain it in individuals that have this condition. If you have two mutant alleles as your only copies of this gene, then you have sickle cell disease, which causes severe, severe pain, cardiovascular disease of many varieties, and generally early death. If you're the heterozygote and you have a single copy of the mutant allele, then you have a condition known as sickle cell trait. And there are medical complications associated with this, so it's not entirely desirable, even though, interestingly, having that uh, genotype confers some resistance to malaria. But there are health consequences. Genome editing could be applied to changing the mutant allele to a wild type allele within the stem cells of a person who's affected. And the, those would be the stem cells in the person's bone marrow. So you could take them out, take all the stem cells out, alter them through genome engineering, and then put them back into the person. And then effectively, they would be cured of having that sickle cell disease or trait. Looking into the future, it's also been discussed that we could edit the human germline in such a way as to eliminate that mutant allele altogether. And then that disease would, in fact, be eradicated. A second reason we might want to render or alter mosquitoes so that they're unable to carry malaria carrying parasites. So let's talk a little bit about malaria for a moment. There are many different types of mosquitoes that can carry the malaria parasite. And the malaria parasite is it's actually a group of parasites that are in the genus called Plasmodium. Malaria is one of the most important infectious diseases on our planet. There are somewhere between 300 and 600 million people on the planet that are infected with this parasite at any given time. 
and almost a million of them, mostly children under five, die every year. This is a terrible global health burden. The parasites, um, as I said, that cause malaria are a few species of the genus Plasmodium, and they are entirely dependent on mosquitoes for their transmission and also for allowing them to sort of become infected. So using genome editing, mosquitoes that are um, capable of carrying the malaria parasite at present, these mosquitoes can have their genomes edited or altered so that they're in fact unable to carry the malaria parasite. So they would be malaria free, which would then keep people malaria uh, free. And we've already, scientists have already engineered mosquitoes like this. And the question is whether we actually move forward and release them. So the engineering of the mosquitoes is done not just by manipulating specific genes within a few mosquitoes, but also connecting those genes to a very controversial genetic system called a gene drive, something that pushes the change through populations at a rate much faster than typical Mendelian transmission would allow. Again, all of these issues are ethical and or have an ethical side. So changing a natural population is highly controversial. There are ethical issues here, but doing this would have the potential to reduce or eliminate serious diseases like malaria and others such as dengue fever. So that's two reasons why we might want to consider or apply genome engineering. A third is also related to human health, and this is that using genome engineering, scientists have already engineered rice, which is one of the most abundant food sources on the planet, into varieties that are called golden rice, and one is shown over here on the right. And this golden rice has been engineered through genome editing so that it produces really high amounts of something called beta or beta carotene. Beta carotene is a precursor to vitamin A. Turns out that vitamin A deficiency affects, you know, somewhere between 190 million people to 200 million people. That's right, I got those numbers right. 190 million to 200 million people a year are vitamin A deficient. This deficiency actually kills close to 2 million of them yearly, and it causes a half a million people on the planet to go blind. So this is a pretty serious health burden. And if people could replace regular rice with this golden rice, then there would be far less vitamin A deficiency. And many of these deaths and blindnesses and other adverse health consequences could be avoided. So there are three specific examples of why genome engineering could potentially benefit humans on the planet. I said I would also tell you about four technologies that can be used for genome editing and two ways that they are um, the same. And so here are the two ways that all genome editing technologies are the same. This is the common ground that you can look for. That, and that is that all of them rely on proteins called nucleases, which I've discussed with my classes before. Nucleases are enzymes that can specifically cut DNA. All genome editing technologies have nucleases as part of their system. They also all utilize DNA repair systems in order to do this. So they, they use DNA repair systems in such a way as to cause a mutation or genetic change that is desirable. So in order to edit a genome, you have to know first precisely what you want to change. So you need a specific target sequence. You need to cut the genome at exactly that sequence. You don't want to have any off-target cutting. And then you have to control how that cut is repaired. So nucleases are the enzymes that do the cutting. And these are generally all endonucleases, similar to restriction enzymes discussed earlier in my classes. And then the DNA repair is accomplished by the proteins that all cells have for double-strand break repair, either homology-directed repair, HDR, or non-homologous end joining. So technologies for genome editing are relatively new. So we're talking about genome engineering kind of coming online in the 2000s. There, it follows up a long history of what's called genetic engineering, which started back in the 70s, most specifically in 1976 with the founding of a very large biotech company called Genentech, still around today and still really active and important in genome editing. 
Genetic engineering back in the 70s is what gave us the ability to produce recombinant insulin instead of getting the insulin that we use to treat diabetes from simply from pigs, which had all kinds of problems associated with it. In genetic engineering, you take new genetic sequences and you put them into an organism that didn't have them before, like E. coli. But you do this somewhat randomly. So for example, you take a plasmid that contains the sequence for a human insulin gene and you stick it into a bacterium, but you aren't really precise about where you're putting that plasmid. You're just adding it to the organism. This is different than genome engineering or editing, where you're being incredibly precise about the changes that you're making in um, an organism. <clears throat> I also said I would give you four, the names of four genome editing technologies, and here they are. Meganucleases, zinc finger nucleases, Talon, and CRISPR slash or dash Cas9. And those are the four systems across the top. These are four major categories or classes of genome engineering systems. And they differ primarily in the differences of the nucleases that are used within the system. Each of those nucleases, by the way, when used for biotech, when used for genome editing, has been engineered. They've all been engineered. So they might have started off as naturally occurring systems, but they've been engineered by people since then. So these are the four major systems that are available today. And most recently, most efforts have focused on the CRISPR-Cas9 system as the most feasible way to very precisely change a genome. In any case, all of these systems can be used to target and induce a double-strand break in a genome very precisely at a particular location. Okay, that, that's important, the precision piece. Once you have a double-stranded break, at a precise location, then scientists can drive how repair occurs in an, also in a very precise way. So on the left, on the left we see re replacement or repair happening, not replacement but repair, happening through what is called non-homology end joining, NHEJ. And this is a repair system that all eukaryotic cells have that essentially just stitches these broken ends back together. And when you do that, what happens is you almost always get an insertion or a deletion at that point. And when you do that, you induce a frame shift mutation that often or usually silences or knocks out whatever gene is at this position. So when you do genome editing and you drive or allow non-homology end joining to occur at the end of that genome editing process, what happens is you usually silence a gene. And this could be really useful in studies where you're trying to figure out, for example, what a particular gene does in um, a mouse system so that you can better understand the function of a gene. In contrast, you can also, as a scientist, drive a different kind of repair and thus achieve a different sort of outcome. So instead of silencing a gene by allowing non-homology end joining to occur as the re repair process, you can add in a bunch of template. And the template could be as a plasmid added to the cell very precisely or added to the nucleus of a, of a eukaryotic cell very precisely. And it contains the sequence that you want to put into this broken genome. So for example, back to that sickle cell example, this template could contain the wild type non-disease associated allele. If you flood the cell with a bunch of this template, what will happen is the, the presence of that template will drive homology-directed repair, and the proteins that naturally exist in cells for HDR will take over, and they'll swap this template in at the site of the break. And that happens in a very precise way, where you'll get a lot of cells on the other side that are corrected and that are, contain a functional working gene that is exactly what you added in as the template. And so you can control in these genome editing con, um, situations, you can control where you cut, and then you can, tr can control how you repair so that you get either a disrupted or silenced gene or a precisely altered gene. And that concludes this mini lecture. I've given you one definition, three reasons why, 
four technologies, and two commonalities, nucleases and repair systems.